Last week we spotted the devil in the details, and this week we're going to decide which Jesus are we going to follow? Which Jesus do we want to follow? And our story comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 27, and it starts in verses 15, 16, and 17. And here's what it says. It says, it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. And so when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus, who was called the Messiah? It was the Passover and the disciples were reclining at the table in the upper room. Just a few minutes earlier, Judas Iscariot had hurried out to carry out his mission of betrayal on Christ. Jesus took the bread and the wine and he gave thanks to the Father, he prayed. He broke the bread and he handed it to his disciples and he said, take, this is my body. Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and he passed the cup to them and he drank from it. And he said, drink, for this is the blood of the covenant which was poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. He gathered his disciples together and he sang a song of praise to the Father. He made his way out of the room and down those stairs and out into the cool air of the city. And as they passed through the city wall, his disciples followed and together they descended down into the valley. There's a valley where they left it. They went down into the valley and they passed over the Kidron Brook and it flowed with beet red blood and it stank. There have been thousands, literally thousands of sacrifices that have taken place over the last couple of days in, prepar in preparation for the Passover meal. Sheep and goats and pigeons and other animals were sacrificed and as they were sacrificed, their blood was channeled down through pipes and under the city and out of the city gate and down into that brook. When they started up the other side, they came to the Garden of Gethsemane and the Garden of Gethsemane wasn't like we think a garden is today. It didn't have a bunch of fancy flowers and beautiful bushes all trimmed and hedged. It was basically an olive garden. It was basically a, a garden full of olive trees. It was an orchard. And weary travelers would use this to stop and rest before they came into the city or after they left the city. It might be a good place to just stop during the summer day and rest in the shade. Jesus entered that garden that evening and he entered to a large tree and he he pointed at it and he said, sit here while I pray. But before Peter, James, and John could sit, he said, you follow me. He said, for my soul is grieved to the point of death. Please follow me. He came to another tree and he pointed to the tree and he said, keep watch with me here. He, they sat down. He continued on a bit further. He Then he fell to the ground and he started praying to the Father. He said, if it's possible, please let this cup pass from me. If it's possible, Lord, but not my will be done, your will be done. And he remained on the ground for a while, and then he got up, and he returned to the three apostles. And when he did, he found them asleep. He said, you men cannot keep watch with me for just one hour. He said, keep praying and keep watch so that you may not enter into temptation, because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He walked away again, knelt down, and began to pray. Blood began to flow from his brow. Three times he prayed that night. Then he stood and returned to the disciples. Are you sleeping, he said. Behold, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of sinners. Arise and be going. The one who betrays me is here. And while he was giving this warning, a large crowd carrying swords and clubs began to gather around him and hem him in. They had been sent by the chief priests to arrest him. Judas, the traitor, was with him, and immediately he went to Jesus and embraced him. Jesus said, friend. He called him friend, giving him one last chance. Friend, do what you have come to do. And Judas kissed him. He betrayed Jesus with a kiss. The mob, seeing the sign, immediately began to surround him and close in on him. And Simon Peter drew his sword and he reached out and he cut the right ear off of the guard named Malchus, a servant of the high priest. Malchus fell to his knees. Blood was pouring through his fingers as he held on to the place where his ear had once been. Time stood still and no one spoke, no one moved. Put away your sword, Jesus said, for all who take up the sword will die by the sword. Do you not think that if I call to my father and appeal, 12 legions of angels will appear and assist me. 12 legions, 6,000 angels per legion. 
and 600 of them on horseback. 72,000 angels were there that evening, and 6,000 of them were in full regalia on war horses. At his disposal that night, the mob surrounded him, but he was surrounded by heavenly angels. That would have destroyed them in the blink of an eye had Jesus wanted. Instead, he simply hung his head and said, but how then will the scriptures be fulfilled? It must happen this way. And as he was saying this, he bent down and he removed Malchus's hand from the hole that was in the side of his head. And when he touched him, his ear was completely restored, completely healed. Turning to the crowd, his voice strengthened a little bit. He said, you've come out with swords and clubs to arrest me like you would a common robber. Every day I sat in the temple with you and I taught you. You did not seize me then. And some of the crowd lowered their eyes and said to no one. And Jesus said to no one particular when they lowered their eyes. He said, but all this had to happen so that the scripture and the prophets would be fulfilled. And those who seized him led him away to Caiaphas, the chief priest. As he stood before Caiaphas, the entire council was looking for a way to have him killed, and false witnesses came forward. There were a number of them. The priests were angry. They were waving their arms. They were pulling their clothes in frustration. They were shouting at him, who are you? Who are you? And he refused to answer. He was silent. Who are you? And they pulled and pulled at their clothes. Tell us who you are. Speak up, O king. Tell us. Finally, after some time, Caiaphas, at his wit's end, pointed to Jesus and he said, I adjure you by the living God. Who do you say you are? Tell us, are you the Christ? Are you the son of God? And he said, it is as you say. <laughs> blasphemy, Caiaphas hollered. Blasphemy, blasphemy. He tore his clothing again. He claims to be the son of God. What more do you need? Blasphemy, away with him. Take him away. So they let him out of the room and as they did, they spit at him. And they began to beat him with their fists. And they beat him so hard with their fists that his eyes began to shut. They were swollen. And each time they hit him, they would yell at him, prophesy to his old king, who was the last one who hit you? Prophesy if you're the Christ, who just hit you? Then they bound him and they beat him some more. And when morning came, the elders and the chief priests wanted him dead. That's all I could think of. They just wanted him dead. So they led him to Pilate the governor of the region. And as Jesus stood before him, still bleeding from all of the beatings, Pilate began to question him. Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus didn't answer. Again, he looked at him. Are you king of the Jews? And Jesus said, it is as you say. Pilate looked at him and said, you don't look like a king. You don't act like a king. He said, this man says he's king of the Jews. But I see no fault in him. I see no reason why this man should die. He doesn't look like a king. His clothes were bloodstained, but the blood that they were, what was on him was, was pouring out of him onto the floor because of the crown upon his head. He had the thorn of crowns on his head and it was dripping off of him. And as Pilate looked at him, he softened a little bit. He looked at Christ and he softened and he shook his head and he said, this man is no king nor does he deserve to die. This certainly isn't an offense that someone should die for. I don't require him to be killed. But the crowd shouted, no, no, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate said, no, he doesn't deserve to die. Do you hear him, Jesus, he said? Do you hear him? They want you dead. Will you not speak to your people? Will you not testify and speak to your people? But Jesus remained silent. Let's look at that scripture again. Matthew 27, verse 15. It was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus, who was called the Messiah? This has always intrigued me, this part of the Bible. How did we get here? We're in the middle of the greatest story ever told. We're in the middle of the greatest love story the world has ever seen. The story of a God who loved us so much that he gave his only son to save us and free us from sin. And of the son who freely gave his life for us to do the same. It's a story of love. It's a story of compassion. It's a story of mercy and grace. It's a beautiful story and smack dab in the middle of it 
we've got this criminal. The whole story stops. It's like we hit a speed bump and the story just comes to a drastic end right here. It stops. And instead of hearing more about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and who he is, we're introduced to this notorious criminal named Jesus Barabbas. He never speaks a word. We know nothing of him. Yet he's a complete interruption to this beautiful narrative. And he occupies at least 38 verses in the Gospels, and he's mentioned in all four books. And I can't tell you much about him at all. As a matter of fact, I can't, can't tell you anything about him. All I can tell you is three sentences. Barabbas was guilty. Jesus was innocent. Jesus died. Barabbas lived. And the crowd made their choice because every time Pilate said, Jesus the Christ, they shouted, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate's amazed. He doesn't want to kill him. He doesn't want to see him killed. He doesn't want to let a murderer like Barabbas go free. Crucify him, they yelled. Crucify him. But he knew the reason. He knew the reason why this was happening because in verse 18 we learn that he knew that it was because of envy that they had handed him over. Anytime anyone envies you, they're going to crucify you. That's just the way life is. Anytime anyone envy you, you'll find out that they'll crucify you at the same time. Plus, Caiaphas wasn't a fool. He knew what the Jewish leaders were doing, and he knew how much money they were making off the people and what the living and the lifestyle that they had. But verse 27 says, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him a message saying, see to it you have nothing to do with that righteous man. For last night I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. Her name was Claudia Procurus, daughter of Augustus who married Pilate. History tells us that by now she had already changed or uh, she'd already converted, I should say, to Judaism. And we will learn through history too that after this event she converted to Christianity and became a strong, strong Christian lady. Verse 20 says, but the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to put Jesus to death. And the governor said to them, which of the two do you want me to release to you? And they said, Barabbas. And Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? Notice how he designates each man. What shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They said, crucify, crucify. But he said, why, what evil has he done? Yet they kept shouting all the more, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate is very, very careful to identify each of the characters, Jesus Barabbas and Jesus the Christ. That's because their names are almost identical. Yahshua means savior, so Barabbas is called a savior. Is he? Hardly, he's not a savior. He's a notorious criminal, a murderer. But who knows, maybe in his mother's eyes, he was a savior to her, and so she named him Jesus. She decides to call him Yahshua. And so it's strange that he holds the same name as Jesus, isn't it? This man who comes out of nowhere, but yet it gets even better because when you understand the word Barabbas, you understand that it means son of the father. Bar means son, like Bar Jonah, son of Jonah, and Rabbis means father. So if you were to translate his name, if you were to translate uh, Jesus Barabbas' name, it would say, Jesus, son of the father. Notice how Pilate calls Jesus son of God or son of Christ. And I don't think that's a coincidence that we have Jesus Savior and son of the father standing up there because it's a choice. Who was the crowd going to choose? Jesus, the son of the father, the son of the world, or Jesus the Christ, the son of God. And that's why I think Pilate is so careful in telling us who he is. There are three players in this story, Jesus and Barabbas and Pilate. And in the eyes of the world, Christ will never be a hero. So we know right now how the story is going to end. The Jews rejected him. They crucified him that day. But they weren't alone. There were a lot of other people in that crowd as well. It wasn't just the Jews. There were tradesmen and merchants. There were Gentiles. There were Romans. There were people from all over the world in that crowd. So the Jews didn't just decide wrong. The world decided wrong on that day. All of the people who were there chose Jesus the Father instead of Jesus, the Son of God. Crucify him, they said, crucify him. In verse 24, now when Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing, 
But rather, rather than a riot was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. You yourself shall see. Pilate was in a bit of a pickle. When he first came to Jerusalem as, their, as, a, as a governor, the first thing he did was march into the temple with shields and pikes with eagles on it. And when he stood in the temple with them, the Jews thought it was a blasphemy because there were false gods inside the temple and they revolted. And Pilate got in trouble with the Romans for it. And he had gotten in trouble on another time and another time. There's two or three different stories. And this was the fourth time. And after the first three, the Roman government said, if you mess up one more time and we see one more riot, you're fired. And this would have been the fourth riot. And so it says that he washed his hands. He said, I want nothing to do with this. I just wash my hands of it. In the Old Testament, when a priest came across the body on the road, he was asked to stop and find water. He was asked to wash his hands. And then he would say, he would say, our hands did not shed this blood and our eyes did not see this blood shed. You'll find that in Deuteronomy. And that way he said, we are washing our hands of this blood. This blood is not on us. He was specifically telling them, he was specifically taking a, a, a law out of their own Bible. But look at verse 27. All the people replied, his blood shall be on us and on our children. Wow, was it ever. You know the story, right? In 70 AD, they lost their temple. It was totally destroyed. They lost their homes. The people were deported. They were slaves. They were driven from their homeland. The Roman army ravaged the area in 70 AD, and the Jews did not return to their homeland until 1948. That's how much blood was shed, and that was the price that had to be paid. For 1,878 years, they paid dearly for the blood that Christ shed that day. Much the same fate that Pilate had too. He too had a choice. He could have chosen the right Jesus. He could have chosen Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God. But he caved into the mob mentality. He caved into the world and he said no. He pleaded with the people to choose Jesus, but in the end, he just turned Jesus over. He should be pitied in a, to a sense because he did believe Jesus innocent, and yet he stole, he, he uh, chose the world instead. What about Barabbas? Let's look at him for just a moment. He was close by. He wasn't very far. He was in, in that room or in that area. You could hear bits and pieces. He couldn't hear all of the words spoken, but he could hear the commotion that was going on. Maybe he heard Jesus and then crucify and crucify. And maybe he heard Barabbas and crucify and crucify. Who knows? But I know he was probably terrified. Yesterday, he was found guilty of a crime, and today, he would be crucified by the cruelest form of torture a man knew, anyone knew. I imagine that night for him has fled by pretty quickly. The sun came up pretty early that morning. The guard's boots probably made a sound on the floor as they walked toward his cell. Barabbas was a dead man. He probably caught his breath and leaned back against the wall as they got closer. Cold sweat began to come down from his brow, and suddenly the door was open, the guard was there, and he reached in and he slammed his hand down on his shoulders, on his shoulder, and he laughed. He said, Barabbas, you old fox, you, the gods have been good to you. Zeus has been good to you this day. Zeus is one, you cheated death, you're going to be released, you're going to be set free. He said, how? How could I be set free? How? What happened? What did I do? He said, you did nothing. Another man has taken your place. Another man, and a Jew at that. What do you say about that, you old thief? Still grinning, the guard began pushing him outside the cell, getting him out through the crowd. Through the crowd, up to the city gate, and all the way the crowd was shouting, Barabbas, Barabbas, Barabbas. When they got outside of the gate, I imagine they turned a little bit to the left, and when they did, they would have seen those three courses, the crosses up on the hill. And I suspect that God probably pointed at them and said, my men put those crosses up yesterday. That middle cross is for you, Barabbas, or at least it was. That was where you're supposed to be right now. See his hands up there, Barabbas? See the nails in his hands? They should be in your hands. The nails in his feet, they should be in your feet right now. Notice how he suffers. He has to rise his body up to take a breath and let his body back down to exhale. 
And he keeps doing that, rising up and breathing, and rising down and exhaling. Exhaling. What's the matter, Barabbas? Is your chest tight? Does your chest feel a little tight? It should be. Go, Barabbas, now go in peace. You've won a victory because this man is dying in your place. Your debt has been paid. So we all see Jesus on that cross as plain as day. Jesus the Christ, the son of the living God who died that day for you and I and Barabbas and billions of others just like you and I. We never hear another word about Barabbas at all. He doesn't show up again in the Bible. He doesn't show up in any writings. But here's what I think maybe, I hope, let's say, happened. I see Barabbas looking up on that hill and seeing that cross and noticing what's going on, seeing Jesus and his suffering. He sees the guard walk away from him and he starts to walk away, he turns his head. He lingers a while, turns his head and starts to walk away. But I can't help but wonder, perhaps he turned around and looked at that cross just one more time. Wouldn't that be something? Perhaps he turned around and looked at that cross just one more time and looked at that man who was dying up there for him, the man who was giving his life so that he could walk out of that jail scot-free. Did he glance back at the hill one more time? I don't know. I'd like to think he did. Because Jesus did the same thing for you and me. That's exactly what he did for you and me. And we should stop every now and then and glance up at that cross and see. And so the choice we have today is choosing the right Jesus. That's the lesson. Barabbas is you and I. Barabbas is every person in the world. That's all there is to the lesson. And the lesson is that Jesus Christ died on that cross for you and I. But you have to choose the right Jesus. There are a lot of Jesuses out there in the world that you can follow. There are a lot of people out there that are good people and nice people and they're wonderful people and good friends, but they're not Jesus Christ and they'll lead you down the wrong path. Someday we'll know what brought us made for his decision. He's stuck with it today. It was 1988 years ago that he made that choice and today he's stuck with it. But you're not, you still have a chance. And so my question this morning is, who will you choose, Jesus or Barabbas?